morning. It's great to see you today, and uh, looks to me like you get a little bit better shot this morning. The lighting's a little bit better. I think the last two mornings at the house, <laughs> that bright selfie light or whatever they call it was uh, was making my head glow a little bit. So nobody needs to see that at six fifty-five on a Wednesday morning. So we're glad you're here. Tony Smith, good to see you as always. I hope you and Vanessa are doing good. And um, we're going to talk about judgment today. And if you if you were here, and I think you were a couple days ago, Tony, when we start talking about judgment, everybody's got, opi everybody's got an opinion. Good morning. I tried to get that camera just a little bit better centered there. I figure yesterday it might have been a little closer than you guys like or would have won. I'm trying to figure out there. Doesn't really look like we're centered there, but still, I don't know if, if I'm crooked or what, but uh, there we go. So we're glad to have you on here this morning. Spirited discussion yesterday in the thread about judgment. And uh, it's spirited because a lot of people that have never even been in church know the scripture, don't judge me. You're not allowed to judge me. And uh, as a Christian, we can go a couple of different directions with this thing. Um, we can not say anything about the issues in the world uh, and, and just try to love people and try to be good to people and see how that works. Because Jesus said, I send you forth as sheep amidst the wolves, be ye therefore wise as the serpent and harmless as the dove. So I got to find a way to live skillfully because wisdom is living skillfully. So I've got to find a way to live skillfully in a world that's that's completely insane right now. There's no sense. There's no logic. There's no common sense left in the world. So when we have a lesson like yesterday where we're talking about judgment and, you know, we had some pretty, some pretty, you know, some heavy hitters in there. Brady Lipscomb uh, is a professor at Tri-State Bible College, a local pastor for many years. Somebody that I believe probably knows as much Bible as anybody. Jody Pastore is a pastor at a church in South Charleston. He knows a lot. Uh, Jay Workman was on here. I'm pretty sure he's a deacon at Cyrus Creek Church. Uh, um, Jay's dad and I are like brothers. And... Um, you know, Eddie was always a Christian, uh, Jay's dad. So, you know, lots of good information is changing hands here. But if you noticed, there were several different takes on different things, right? Um, so we really had to be careful. Why do I, you know, if I'm watching Pam and Butch's life closer and I'm watching mine, guess what? I probably, gonna, I probably have a problem. If I'm watching Maureen and Glenn and I'm always like, Maureen, you know, you're a young Christian. You know, you need to, you need to do better. And Maureen gets upset at me and says, well, you know, you don't know what I'm doing, you know. Um, there's where I think our problem is as Christians. And as I talked about my high school friend, Michelle Richardson, uh, she shared a campaign that's going on from some big church organization where they're spending $100 million. Uh, I, I always remember those nice round figures like $100 million, right? But they're spending $100 million and the slogan is this. Don't go to hell because of, of your Christian friends. And and you say, oh my gracious, who would say something like that? But what they're trying to get across is us self-righteous Christians are just steamrolling the lost world. We're steamrolling people that we're judging and we have no clue about. And it's all up to Jesus whether these people live or die, whether they see eternal life or not. So, you know, and once again, you know, I understand it's just like the prodigal son or the lost son parable. If you remember that, man, when, when that prodigal son was lost and he came home, father was, was going crazy, man. Father ran through the, through the robe around him, gave him a big old hug and a kiss, yelled to the servants, kill the fatted calf, call the neighbors. We're having a big old party, you know? 
And then the brother comes in, and the brother is like what we're going to talk about here this morning, the self-righteous moralist person, right? Uh, he's coming in, he's like, wait a second. This guy, there's no way that this guy can come back into father's service and in the household and get anything back from father when I've stayed the whole time. I've done what you've told me to do. And there was a lot of problems in the early church. In fact, Peter and or yeah, Peter, excuse me, and Paul got into it on more than one occasion. Because what Paul, Peter tried to do is Peter tried to say, look, let's keep all these rules and regulations from being a Jewish person and let's bring it over and make it the rules and regulations to being a Christian, right? To being a born again believer. See, and that and it won't work that way. And that's sort of what we're going to get into here today. And it's one reason it has been a stumbling block to the Jewish people because in our Sunday school class and Butch and Pam can tell you, uh, we've been in the book of Leviticus and they're into the different sacrifices and there will be sacrifices again on this earth in the millennial kingdom. So um, you, you wonder, well, why do we need that? I don't know why we need things. All I know is when I look in that Bible in the Old Testament, it starts picturing things that are going to come to pass in the New Testament. And that's part of the prophecy and believing in and how God just adds a little more truth as we go, right? So once again, I always love the comments and I'm not going to directly attack anybody for making a comment about something on Jesus Christ because I'm not qualified to tell you if you said the right thing or the wrong thing. But all I do know is if I go back and count all the comments other than our general, good morning, how are you, Karen Midkiff? Good morning, Shirley Meadows. Good to see you. Uh, Maureen, Glenn, uh, Butch, uh, Pam, you know, other than our good mornings, brothers and sisters like David and David White just posted, other than that, we don't get a lot of people posting like we did yesterday. Why is that? It's because the whole world is living on the fact that people are saying, well, you can't judge me. Oh, no, you're not judging me. The Bible says you can't judge me. Right? That is true, okay? And the Bible also has a parable in there about letting the wheat and the tares grow together, right? So, so there's a situation there where sometimes by attacking, I'm tearing up more than I'm helping. And plus, me as a Christian... I affected a lot of people's lives before I got saved in a bad way. So my hope and prayer, like with this program and everything I do, I want you to want what I got, what I have, and that's Jesus. Now, why do I want you to want Jesus? Well, number one, as soon as I came to Jesus, I realized, hey, man, I should have been here 20 years soon. So that was one thing. But the other thing is everything in my life that needed to go, <laughs> needed to go, Right. And there were things I was having trouble with, but I had to surrender. And I still had problems in my life when I surrendered, but God worked those things out. He got rid of the things that needed to go in my life. That's the power of God. See, if I say, well, look here, guys, I'm going to get saved, but what I want to do is I'm going to get my life all tidied up and all squared away. And when I'm perfect, I'm coming to Jesus. Well, see, Jesus doesn't show his power in that because if you could do it, then you wouldn't need God, see? So anyway, we are in uh, Romans chapter two, verse one. Let me read this to you. It says, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, you condemn yourself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. So once again, who's Paul talking to? He's gonna turn his attention to the self-righteous, moralist people and those are the kinds of Christians today that are absolutely killing churches everywhere, right? You can go into these old dead churches out here that don't have anybody, and you can spot for a million miles away why they don't have anybody, right? They got one or two of the old people that are controlling everything, and they're bossing everybody, and they hurt your feelings, and they talk to you like a dog, and all these things happen, and, you know, a lot of times... People will pull this parable of the tares and the wheat. Ah, you can't have that. You tear up the church. Well, half this church is so-and-so's family and half this church is somebody else's family. You're going to answer for that one day, right? Why are you going to answer? Because you've allowed things to go on that you shouldn't have allowed, right? But you did it because you didn't want to fight about it. You didn't want to argue about it. So you said, well, but isn't that what you're supposed to do? So there it is. You know, we can sit and we can argue and we can fight all day. But here's what the Bible says about it. And we're going to talk about the judgments that God's going to present on mankind um, today. 
And it's pretty amazing where the judgment goes for us as believers. So by the end of all these things, I'll just cut to the chase. By the end of all the judgments that are going on, we are in a position where we judge angels. So I don't know about you. I'm not fit to judge anybody, right? But there's going to be a point. We're going to be transformed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. We're going to have a glorified body. We're going to move and have a being just like Jesus. And that's going to be a wonderful thing. And I hope we can get to it today. So it's good to see Myrtle and Stephanie, David White. Good to see you. So thou art inexcusable. So there'll be no excuses, okay, when you judge somebody else, when you do the same thing. Have you ever noticed that? You know, the homosexual thing is a big thing that, that's going on in society today. And, uh, you know, if you go back and look, and I, I haven't done extensive searches, but being in the school system, you know, you see things, you hear things. Um, and, and, you know, every show on TV is a crime drama. So, I mean, whether it's Criminal Minds or whatever, you know, I'm always watching forensic files or something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I got a warped mind. I don't know. But anyway, I say all that to say this. That there's always usually a lot of trauma in this situation. And uh, I'm not trying to excuse anything <clears throat> or the way that people uh, do or don't do. But how many times do we really pray for the victim in things, right? And I think about the abortion thing. <clears throat> you know, we're, <clears throat> we're uh, you know, we're, we're mad. We're, we're tore all to pieces about uh you know, um, somebody that would consider this, uh, when at the same time, you know, it says you do the same things. That's just what we just read. And I don't know about you, but I would have to think, and as a man, some people say, well, you know, you're a man, you shouldn't even be uh, commenting on what a woman's rights are, what a woman can do and what she can't do. And, you know, maybe there's a lot of truth in that as well, you know, but I bet you anything, if you could, if you could do a poll of all the people that have ever had an abortion that it's the most heartbreaking thing that would ever happen in their life, right? Uh, now, I'm not going to say that some people don't use that as birth control or something of that nature, but I'm telling you, just I bet you, if you had the numbers on that, you would find out that that's the biggest regret that people have in their life, right? And a lot of times, because there's not any support around, people do stuff because there's nobody there to ration these things out, you know? And let's be honest from a child standpoint, you know, <clears throat> you know, do you want in that situation? And once again, I'm not saying it's okay to do this because anything God has made, God formed us uh, in the womb, right? God knitted us together before you were in the womb. God knew you is what it says. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> in the Bible. So these are heartbreaking things. And if you notice, the closer we're getting to the rapture of the church, the more intense these issues are getting. So a lot of people say, well, you know, we're, we just got to do this because this is the right thing to do. And we're going to pass this law and make it that everybody can do whatever. Well, the problem with that is we worship a God that has never changed. So it's really difficult in this whole big old world we're living in when we get into something and we realize you know, that man has changed in some respects, but it's not that they've changed because they've always been evil. See, Noah got wiped out with the flood and Noah and his family were the only ones that escaped, right? Then God set up human government, right? After Noah gets off the ark. So we started following some human government, right? Got to have law and order in society. And I know you get tired of me saying that, but what we need it in schools and we need it in our community. And if you don't do it and, and you don't institute these things in school, it, it's not going to come out here uh, in society because we're turning all these young maniacs loose out here. So anyway, there's my take on that. So it's inexcusable for me to judge another man's servant. Okay. And that's where we go. So, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them, which commit such things. So again, Paul says, look, for you to judge, you know, it's inexcusable. You have no right to judge somebody else's servants. It's up to him whether they live or whether they die. Uh, so you can't condemn them. But here's the other thing is when God judges something, it's going to be act absolutely accurate. So we're going to get into some of the judgment here that God's going to turn loose on mankind. And, and 
we don't want to be in God's wrath. We don't want to be in the tribulation period. So we want to accept Jesus. We want this relationship with Jesus. We want to accept the Holy Spirit because from that is where the love, the joy, the peace, and the long suffering is going to come from, right? We want those things from the Lord, right? So that's where we're at with this. Now, <clears throat> he gets down to verse three and he says, and think it's this old man that judges them which do such things and doeth the same thing, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. <clears throat> There's a lot of people that are tore all to pieces about the homosexual when really in, in their own minds and really in their deep fantasy desires, they want to try it themselves. And, and that's been kind of proven out through psychology and different things. When somebody really attacks something, for example, let's take a boys and girls dating. No, have you ever heard the story about people that hated each other all the way through high school and then they got married and spent 50 years together? See, there's a thin line between love and hate, right? And, and what God's trying to get across is <clears throat> we're so bad about judging other people but really, a lot of times their actions are reflections of things I would love to be doing, but I'm just such a self-righteous moralist that I'm going to attack them for doing it. But really deep in my heart, God's looking at that and he's like, man, you know, you'd, you want to be doing that too. So who needs worked on, right? I mean, maybe you might take on this and say, well, Lunsford, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. But read these verses. It says you do the same thing. You know, the things you're condemning everybody else for, you do those same things. Do you think you'll escape the judgment of God? That's Romans chapter 2, verse 3 right here. Then he goes on down. He says, Or do you despise thou the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and the long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? So now what's he saying? He's saying, look at this situation, okay? The riches and the goodness right? And, and the long suffering, hey, that's fruit of the spirit. That's one of the, the points of fruit of the spirit is long suffering, okay? See, the goodness of God leads the leads people to repentance. So are we being used to the devil when we get mad and start yelling, you're going to hell. All you sinners are going to hell. You people that commit a, a, a adultery are going to hell. You people that do abortion are going to hell. You homosexuals, you're all going to hell. Everybody's going to hell but me and my denomination. I mean, listen, I guarantee you've heard that. If you've been in church in Appalachia, you've heard it, right? Now, who wants what I have? And I posted this yesterday as a response to somebody. Look, I knew I was sinning. But I guarantee this, when I was under con conviction, you didn't want to stick your nose right up under my fist and say, hey, Lunsford, you're on your way to hell because you might have got one of those, right? Let's be honest because you're under conviction. You know where you need to be. Grandma's telling you how hot hell is. You're driving by the church house and it's all you can do to not break out in tears. You know you need to do that. Now, do you really need somebody up in your face yelling, you're going to hell? Man, I already knew that. But what you could be is a light to somebody that's trying to find the path. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You know, I'm not saying it to brag, but I mean, I was a pretty good sinner. What do you mean pretty good sinner? I mean, I, you know, across the board, I, I dotted every I, crossed every T, you know. And I can sympathize with a lot of things that people go through, you know. And I could tell you, you know, I mean, there's some things that, well, I understand how you feel. No, you don't understand how somebody feels if you haven't been through it, right? And uh, I'm seeing a lot of people my age, their parents are passing away. Yeah, you know, my parents passed away. My dad passed away. I was in my mid-20s, right? My mom, uh, she she only passed away a few years ago. But, you know, those are traumatic things because those are your people that cheered for you no matter what. Right. And, and sometimes I forget about that. And I see people post, oh, I'm devastated that mom and dad have died. Oh, I'm devastated that so and so died and they were 90 years old. And it's like, you know, the goal for the Christian is to get out of here to heaven. Right. Now, we miss people. 
But at the same time, the goal was let's get to heaven, right? Anyway, I got to digress there a little bit, had a, a squirrel moment, right? So, <clears throat> but after the hardness and the impenitent heart, treasurous up unto myself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So once again, what's he doing here? Don't be ignorant is what this translates to. Don't be ignorant of God, but understand God's design to bring people to repentance. Why does God let terrible things happen? Well, a lot of times until we're standing by ourselves in our sin or in our situation, we never call on the name of the Lord. Why does God let me hurt like this? Why did God let this happen? Why did God, all the time God's trying to just pull you closer. But in the good times, it's hard to get pulled closer to God because you can't wait to tell, look what I did. Look how good I did. Man, I tell you what, I got a promotion at work. We're buying a camper. We're gone. And on the weekends, we won't be able to help out at church. We're not going to do anything. We're going to be gone. Now, once again, why do we do this Sunday school class? I believe Jesus is an everyday God. But somewhere along the line as a new Christian, I've got to get in a place where they're teaching Bible lessons and I got to learn this Bible. I got to let that Holy Spirit loose inside of me and I'm going to feed one of two things. I'm going to feed the new spirit of God that lives inside of me and I'm going to get excited because the Holy Spirit's going to excite me by opening up God's word to me or I'm going to continue on the path of, well, you know, I, I'm, I know I got saved and then my growth gets stunted because I don't get rooted and grounded in the word and I don't get in the right church. So now I didn't take a job. And so not and, and somewhere down the line, I just kind of wander back off out into the world. It happens all the time. It happens a lot of time in churches. And you wonder, why am I on the church all the time? I'm on the church all the time because they've got an obligation to help these young preachers and young teachers. And when these young women come in with these kids into the nurseries and into teaching Sunday school, Man, they, why'd they bring their kid to church? Why'd they get up early on Sunday morning when they could have slept in and bring that kid? You need to get those women in there, boys in there, whatever they are, and get them teaching, get them doing, because there's work to be done, right? <clears throat> so let's go a little further, okay? So Paul explains how and why God will judge and how he can judge both the Jewish people and the Gentiles, and how he will be completely fair in the process. So see, we're going to be judged according to our deeds because deeds give incontrovertible or yeah, incontrovertible proof of what's in the heart. Oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Okay. When's the last time you went to church and jumped up and praised the Lord in front of everybody? Well, we don't do that at my church because we're too busy. Our church is too big to stand up and praise the Lord. Okay, well, you know, where's your work? Show me something you're doing for Jesus that separates you out from the same amount of knowledge uh, or the same uh, love of Jesus that the devil has. Well, the devil don't love the Lord, yeah, but he's got all the head knowledge. He's seen it all. The devil knows more Bible than any of us, right? But he won't be in heaven, so what happened? What's the deal here? And that's where you and I are at in this thing today, see? A lot of people, oh, I'm going to heaven. Oh, I'm okay with God. God and I, we, we, uh, we got an understanding. We don't have an understanding because when the works are pulled out and you're judged by your deeds that you did as a Christian, wow, we got a prop. Now, for those that just raise complete hell their whole life and, and turn down every opportunity to meet the Lord, they're not going to last long at the, at the judgment. It's going to be, depart from me. I never knew you, right? Man, how heartbreaking is that going to be? especially when you go to Luke 16, starting in verse 19, and you read about how they're going to get a glimpse of heaven, and then they're going to see probably the people that have come to them over the years and how they were mean and rude and obnoxious to people, and all those people did was love them and care about them and want them to get saved. Whew. Heartbreaking, isn't it? All right, so the deal is this. You're going to be a judge according to your deeds because that's going to show me where my heart is. Faith without works is dead, James would tell us, right? Show me thy works. Now, my works will not save me. I get saved because I believe that Jesus can save me. I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins, knowing that he's the only one who can forgive me. Now, I've opened up a prayer life. 
Now I need to get serious. Now I need to get to the things of God and what he wants me to do. So let's look here about what's going to happen to those that get regenerated. Um, a regenerated heart means I was lost in sin, born dead, separated from God with the sin nature. But now in verses 7 through 10, guess what happened? I accepted the call of the Lord. March 1997, I can take you to the place and I can tell you the time where the Lord saved me. And if you can too. Now here's the deal. If you can't take me to the place and tell me the time where the Lord saved you or where you rededicated your life to the Lord, um, we got a problem. That's true, isn't it? So there you go. Matthew Harris, we great work on all the things you're doing, sharing a message out there and doing things. Very good work. So, um, so let's read about it. To verses 7 through 10. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. See, I'm seeking eternal life. Now, the day I got saved, I had no clue. What I was seeking was to know I wasn't going to go to hell. But it wasn't so much I was seeking eternal life. But now after being saved for 25 years, I'm starting to look around. I'm saying, man, whew, Lord, thank you. Praise you. Praise you, Lord. I praise you for saving me. I praise you for giving us this Bible. I praise you for Matthew. And I praise you for Myrtle and Benita and Stephanie and Butch and Pam and Biff. And, I mean, who am I missing? Terry and all of us on this Sunday school class because Guess what? It would have been really easy to roll over and say, man, I'll catch him on the replay, which is perfectly fine too, right? But look at this. See, we are going to do be well-doing and we're going to seek glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. That's what I want. But unto them that are contentious and they do not obey the truth, but they obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Once again, the Jewish people are God's chosen people, but they rejected the Lord. And because of that, man, they're going to be the first ones to be judged, right? And it's already happening for those that have perished since the church age has started. So, but glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also, excuse me, to the Gentiles. So the the Jewish man or woman that accepts Jesus Christ, that the Messiah has come, he's good to go. He's born again. He's regenerated, right? Same thing's going to happen in the tribulation period. Some people will be saved. So that's how it's going to happen. So that gets us down through um, where we're at. That tells you God's chosen people. God is not done with the Jewish people. Some people would say, uh, God hates the Jewish people and all this anti-Semitism thing that you're seeing in the news right now, man, that is lining up so much with the Bible that it is insanity. I mean, every single thing that, that God said was going to happen and how society was going to go down the tube, it's happening. As a good friend of mine from high school, David and I were talking yesterday, it happened rapidly. The last five or 10 years, it has just like somebody threw a can of gasoline on the craziness that's going on in this world. So that's kind of where we're at in this thing. So um, let me go just a little bit further. For there is no respect of persons with God, right? Man, I didn't really get started at all in this today, did I? For there is no respect of persons with God. God doesn't care about your money. God doesn't care who your daddy is. God doesn't care about your position in your company. And this is the hardest thing for me in politics is, you know, I try to go to events and I try to campaign and you get these prideful, arrogant people that wouldn't spit on you if you was on fire and people just fall in love with these people. <laughs> and I'm like, do you realize these people would run over you in a heartbeat like a tailback at a football game if you got in their way on something? But anyway, it's just the pride and arrogance that, that people have. So... Uh, it says, for as many as have sinned without the law, they shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do the natural things the law contained, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, 
and the thought the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now the next stanza, and we're going to go through the judgments tomorrow, but the next stanza deals with cautions against hypocrisy. See, there's some judgments coming where God's going to judge mankind, and I wanted to get more into that, but these verses just jumped off the page because they're important, okay? But we're going to look at all the different places where judgment is going to happen. The judgment for all the sins that's ever going to happen was judged on that cross when Jesus was nailed to that cross. So all the sin debt is paid for, all the sin judgment, sin was judged, found guilty, put to death, if you will, right? And Jesus died to cover all of that sin. He was the Passover, right? He died, he covered it all. Now, what are, where are you and I in this whole thing today, okay? We're standing right here at present time Bible. Any day, Jesus could say, get them. Or God would say, Jesus, go get the children. And we would leave out of here and you'd be left behind if you don't follow Jesus. See, we love you enough to tell you that. Oh, I love Facebook and social media and live, Facebook Live because I'm not putting you on the place. I don't know how, how many tears you're crying right now, right? But I know this, that I knew where I was at. And if I, th I think if somebody would have been here like this, non-threatening, not wanting to grab me and push me to the altar, not making me feel, you know, worse than I already felt, you know, and I'm not saying that that's not part of the conviction process, but look, the, the idea is to show people that Jesus loves us enough to die for us. Jesus paid the sin debt. And that's the first thing we're going to cover tomorrow is all the sin debts paid for. You can't pay for your own sin debt because number one, you don't have the money. And number two, your sin, the wages, what you have earned from your sin is death according to Romans 6.23. So you can't get there from here, right? So to speak. So if I can't get to heaven, living the life that I'm living, how am I going to straighten it up? I'm not going to. I'm going to surrender. Then I'm going to let God take care of it, right? Okay, I hope you got something out of there. It's inexcusable for us to judge other people. I'm going to judge you wrong, number one. But number two, my judgment means nothing anyway. My judgment just stirs stuff up. Well, Terry Hoffman, I saw what you did the other day, and you shouldn't have done that. Well, I saw you post something on Facebook, and that was stupid. You know, it's none of my business, and it's none of your business what I do, right? Now, if you saw me do something, which, you know, anything's possible, right? Please feel free to say, hey, Lunsford, whoa, did you mean to say this? Because, man, I'm typing sometimes, and especially when you're typing on your phone, maybe I typed out something wrong, right? And maybe I'm wrong on something. Listen, this Bible, I could I could read something and, and it would be wrong. Feel free to correct me. And I won't say somebody couldn't hurt my feelings, but my feelings have been trampled a few times. <laughs> so if you don't get the desired effect of hurting my feelings, don't don't worry, right? Because that's it. But uh, we've got to learn to toughen up a little bit as Christians. One of our biggest problems today is our feelings get hurt and we quit shining our light, but we're supposed to be the light of the world, and it's really easy for people to get saved right now because the Holy Spirit is still here. So let's do our very best to be love, joy, and peace toward other people. All right, Rebel Hoffman, I hear you, man. But listen, let's do our best. Do we judge the abortion situation? Well, God formed you in the womb. That should tell you all you need to do. Should we judge the um, homosexual thing? Well, acts with the same sex, you know, were forbidden just like sex with animals that was recorded in Leviticus. Now, do I beat on that? Am I going to start showing up at rallies and, and am I going to go kill three people that believe that way? No, but the serial killers have done that, right? That's a warped situation because I don't know that God's not going to save these people and change their hearts and then they're not going to go out and be the next apostle Paul. That's the other reason I used to think sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I'll give you this, you know, I've had enemies and I thought, well, I'm, I'm just, you know, what if I killed this person, you know? But, you know, it was, I was young and really stupid then. But, but here's the thing, 
why don't we just go avenge those that hurt us? Is what if somebody would have said, look at this apostle Paul right here. Let's go kill this guy because, man, he's persecuting a Christian. So let's, us four or five Christians get together. We're the elders of the church. Let's just go down here and kill this guy. We don't need God's input on this. Do you see where that could have presented a problem? How many people would have done what Paul did once Paul understood that Jesus Christ was the true Messiah? Paul dedicated the rest of his life, his physical body. He counted it as joy to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ because he'd even killed Christians. You see, so Paul, God needed Paul because, look, there's a lot of us today that aren't doing near what we need to be doing, Right? So if somebody would have went out and killed Paul, now God would have still accomplished his will. And Terry and I talk about this all the time. Well, if God's will is going to be accomplished, what are we doing? What are we praying? I can't answer all that, right? All I know is God's going to judge me according to my deeds. And my, G my commission in Acts 1-8 was to tell everybody about Jesus. Your commission is the same in Acts 1-8, which is to tell people about Jesus. If you're the town gossiper, it's probably going to be hard for you to turn the channel on that. And now I'm going to quit gossiping here for a couple hours and tell you how much I love Jesus and how much you need Jesus. Well, but aren't you the one that spread that rumor about da 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 da? Oh yeah, but 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 that was you know that wasn't that rumor. That's the truth. <laughs> See, people still don't get it on gossip. But I got to roll. Listen, have a great day. We'll look forward to talking to you in the morning. But there's judgments that are coming. And the judgment of sin was the last was the first judgment that God said, here's the judgment. Now, I'm not talking about first time God judged something because when he judged all the people that were alive in Noah's time and found them all to be sinners, you know, he knocked it all out. It's hard to tell in the history of, of God since he's always existed how many times God's done that. Because for you and I to be faithful over a few things and become ruler over many, how many things could there possibly be to rule over on this earth? Say. Because we're going to move and we're going to have our being and we're going to be able to get out of here in this universe just like God does. And if you look at science, science has identified 50 billion galaxies out here. Not 50 billion planets, galaxies. We're in the Milky Way galaxy, I think is what ours is called. Made up of these 10 planets. See? So anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you go. Lord, we're thankful. Thankful for all that you've done. We praise you for your power. We praise you for your glory. We praise you for giving us this Bible. We can understand it. We can apply it to our lives. We can grow in it as much as we want to grow due to the doctrine of illumination that the more we seek to understand it, the more that Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is going to open it up and it's going to be joy and joy and joy. Now, Lord, as we look at the world, we see there's a lot of pain and agony out here in the world. I can go out here and I can judge and I can scream and holler and in the safety of Facebook Live here this morning, you're going to hell for all you're doing. You people are going to go to hell. But look, if we love them and if we tell them, read that Bible, let you, Lord, take over their hearts, let you convict of what's right and what's wrong. I can't judge them. I don't know. Them, and it's not my place to judge. They're your servants. They're created in your likeness and your image, no matter if they accept you or not. And not only that, but it's up to you whether they live or they die because you're the only one that truly knows if any of us are saved. Wow, it's pretty powerful. We thank you, Lord, to make th that you made salvation free, that you made it plain to understand, that you showed us that the way and the truth and the life, the eternal life, is through Jesus Christ, according to what Jesus said in John 14, 6. We're looking forward to a day when you come and you take us out of here to a place where the day will never end with no more tears, no more sorrow, and no more pain. Lord, our prayer list is always, always has the military at the top of the page. Our veterans that have already served us, please protect them and help those men and women. Our policemen, our firefighters, they need our respect. They need our support. We value our heroes on the front lines doing these crazy tough jobs right now. Our school kids need your prayers. Lots of things going on in the school system. Crazy, crazy time in the school system. So we ask for you to be at the school system. We're asking you also, Lord, to be with the teachers. The teachers, 
man, we got to get discipline back in school because if there's no discipline in school, there won't be discipline in society, and we got to have them in both places. It's going to be tough. Biting a bullet, man, we're going to have to send a bunch of them home. If you don't send the kids home and clean it up, you're, you're, you're not going to have any teachers. That's just what... That's just already what's going on around the country, and it's happening even right here in uh, West Virginia. So, Lord, we ask for you to be with those teachers and help them to to get the respect they deserve, to get the pay they deserve, because it's 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 a circus, and, and they need your your support. All school personnel. Also, ask for you to be with the, the hospitals. The hospitals are uh, burned out. The nurses are tore all to pieces there with all the pain and anguish and. You know, say, well, COVID's over. Well, COVID's really not over for some of these things. If you've noticed now this year on the flu, the flu has gotten here earlier than ever. There's always going to be something in the medical community. So, Lord, I hope these people get rested up. And I hope because it's a calling. That, that medical thing is a ministry of its own. Not everybody can do it. So we hope and pray that these men and women get rested up that they can continue on with their ministry. Lord, our ministry is to tell people about Jesus. I love Facebook Live and TikTok and all these things that Matthew Harris is sharing this message out, YouTube and everything, because every time we put a little bit of Jesus in these places, it pushes the devil back just a little bit. Lord, we all have unspoken prayer requests that are on our heart. Please help us in every possible way to achieve what you would have us to achieve. And we will not fail to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We love you guys in Jesus. We appreciate you so much. Uh, we'll get a little further down the road on this judgment. Tomorrow we're going to go right through the different judgments God is going to lay out on mankind. The first judgment was the judgment of the sins. The judgment was made. Jesus died to pay for the sin debt of the whole world. And I already spoiled the secret the last a judgment is when God empowers us to judge angels. So I don't know about you, but we're going to have to come a long way from where I am right now to where I'm going to have the ability to judge an angel. Have a great day. See you tomorrow. Good morning. It's great to see you today. And uh, it looks to me like you get a little bit better shot this morning. The lighting's a little bit better. I think the last two mornings at the house, <laughs> that bright selfie light or whatever they call it was uh, was making my head glow a little bit. So Nobody needs to see that at 6.55 on a Wednesday morning. So we're glad you're here. Tony Smith, good to see you as always. I hope you and Vanessa are doing good. And um, we're going to talk about judgment today. And if you if you were here, and I think you were a couple of days ago, Tony, when we start talking about judgment, everybody's got a everybody's got an opinion, and all of us have a real tendency to know this verse about you can't judge me, you can't judge me. Everybody sort of knows that one. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what we learn today. So Tony, it's always great to see you. Biff Yeager, always great to see you guys. We're going to talk about judgment the way God's going to do it. And guess what? That's all that's going to matter. All this other crazy stuff that's going on in the world, uh, it's not going to matter. It's God's judgment that's going to matter. And, you know, it's not up to me to judge you because I have no clue what you do. But what we're going to learn today is God has seen everything. God knows everything. And so when God judges, he's going to judge according to the truth on this. So that's the scary part is I don't know about you guys, but I want to be on the side where God says, look, you know, Jesus covered your sin debt, and, you know, I know that uh, you love me, and, you know, you're not perfect, Lunsford. The Lord knows you are not perfect. But, you know, I want to, you know, I, I want you to know you've still made some mistakes. But anyway, I don't want to spoil the story. But here's the deal, okay? Um, we are going to go from the position that we're in today and let's hope that everybody on here is a believer. Because if I'm a believer, I've got a prayer life. Because now God's hearing my prayer if I'm saved. If I'm not saved, God's not hearing that prayer. And that's the heartbreaking thing. There's so many people that are out here. And uh, they're like, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. I'm like, well, wouldn't you like to be able to pray for yourself? Well, yeah, how do I do that? Well, you got to be saved. Because if you're not God's, you see... 
Um, how in the world would, why would God hear your prayer if you're not his child? You know, that'd be like me going to Terry Hoffman's house and saying, uh, you know, won't you adopt me and start taking care of me and doing everything? And Terry's like, look, I've got two kids, right? Of course, they're up and on their own now anyway. But my point is, you know, why would God hear our prayer if we're not his, right? So it's good to see everybody here this morning. You all saw the comments from a few days ago. Everybody has a take on judgment, okay? Everybody has a take on yeah, and when we all knew this, even before we were saved, if there was one scripture we knew, it was, you're not allowed to judge me, right? And, and we all knew it. Um, but here's the thing. You know, we had a lot of people pop in and say, we got to tell the world they're sinners. Well, do you really need to tell them that? I mean, because nobody needed to tell me. I knew if I died in my trespasses and sins, I'd go to hell. And that's part of what brought me to Jesus. And the other thing on all this is, you know, people look at somebody and say, well, you can't do this and go to heaven, and you can't do that and go to heaven. Well, it doesn't matter what you think somebody can do and can't do. There's several lessons in the Bible about the weaker brother and the stronger brother, and the bottom line is you need to surrender to God and let God start working in your life. Then this thing's going to get good, and then God's going to start showing you some things, and I'm going to prove it to you right here as we get into this. So yesterday... We read Romans chapter 2, probably the first 15 or 16 verses, which kind of showed us how it is inexcusable for whosoever thou art that judges. And that's verse number 1. So there is no way I can justify, having read that verse, me judging you for what you're doing. Okay? Now, since God made all of us Christians fishers of men, am I going to have more success leading somebody to the Lord or at least getting them to hear the gospel message, if I come to them in love, joy, and peace, or if I come screaming at them, you're going to hell, you know, you're living in sin, you know, you're, you know, God doesn't even want you, on and on and on and all kinds of craziness, right? That's not what God wants us to do, because guess what, you know? I never saw anybody converted on anything, even if you're in sales. I've been in sales all my life. You know, and, you know, I'm probably decent at it, but it takes it takes a lot of skill to, to, to argue with somebody and then convert them to your way of thinking. I mean, let's be honest. You know, even the Apostle Paul uh, was at Agrippa that uh, he, he gave this amazing testimony of his own life and how Jesus had touched him. And, and Agrippa, I think it was, said, Paul, you've almost persuaded me to believe. See? So there is some convincing that us as Christians need to do. And a lot of us are really great at shooting our mouth off about what's going on in society. But at the same time, if we'll slow this thing down just a little bit and realize, I want you to want what I have, and that's Jesus Christ. And if I'm out here and I'm loud and I'm obnoxious and I'm a pain, uh, then we got a problem. Yes, sir, David. And we talked about that in, in the judgments, in the verses that we did read. If, you know, we're really bad. At, and I like to add a little something to the mud that is in or the speck of dust that's in somebody else's eye. We want to get that out with a pocket knife. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then Jesus said, but then you've got this big old beam that's sticking out of your own eye. And Jesus says, look, get the beam out of your eye. Then maybe you'll be able to see, you know, what you need to see, you know, in regards to judging somebody else. So, anyway, let me get this going because uh, uh, I love it. I love the discussion. I love the comments. And, and realize this. Always make these comments. Don't ever let me discourage you because we don't know who's listening. And they may see something that catches their attention. They may listen for a few minutes. And they may find out how to get to Jesus. Because see, above, above all the things that we're doing here this morning, we want you to be able to get to Jesus. How do I get there? Believing, right? So let's talk about that. Let's look at how God has judged the world throughout the ages. In the Old Testament, it's pretty simple, right? We remember how God uh, destroyed the whole world uh, and during the flood. And here's the thing. If you go back and you read about the life of Noah, you're going to find out Noah preached for 120 years. Nobody got saved. 
us as Christians, whether it's on visitation or where we're trying to witness to people, we get very discouraged because, let's be honest, we didn't want to hear it and nobody else wants to hear it, right? And that's why if I come to you in love or in hate and spewing you're going to hell and telling you, you know, you don't deserve it, and you know, because none of us deserve Jesus, right? But if that's the way I approach you, I'm never going to get that back. And that's why I constantly am saying, look, if you've got something against me, uh, if you're mad at me or you think I'm mad at you, please private message me. Let's get that out of the way because I don't want to hinder you getting to heaven. Because I just have this vision of a lot of people coming before God and saying, well, God, I watched Brooke Lunsford's life and, you know, I, I hated him or he hated me or we had a bad business deal or we did whatever we did. And I figured if Brooke Lunsford's going to heaven, that everybody was gone. And, and I hate to continuously bring that up. But a lot of people are going to try to use excuses to, to bypass God getting to heaven. And there won't be an excuse. And here's why. Okay, we're coming to it here in just a second. So... We saw God destroy the world. We saw Noah preach for 120 years. Nobody got saved. We saw how that boat was built to where it couldn't be tipped over. Now we know why. Because all these people are clawing at this boat to get on the boat, but you can't always get on the ark of safety. Lots of preaching in that message right there. Only God's call will get you into heaven. Only you answering God's call is going to get you saved and get you on the path to heaven. Scary stuff. Okay, so let's go a little further. We know about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Uh, we know that Abraham wrestled with the angel of the Lord and said, please don't destroy this. What about if there's five or 50 people, 40 people, 30 people, you know, 10 people, wherever it ended up. But anyway, when they go down, all they did take out of the city was Lot, his wife, and his daughters, and, and they were told not to look back. And if you go back and look at this, Solomon, or Solomon, uh, Lot's wife could not pass up the opportunity to look back at what was, and the moment she looked back, she turned to that pillar of salt. So, heartbreaking, because, man, when the fear and the pain and the agony is behind you, and you've been delivered, you need to keep going forward. And that's what us saved people need to go to continue to do. Don't look back at what you were. Don't look back at where you've been. Go forward in the name of Jesus, right? <clears throat> so, we saw about the Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction. We saw, if you've ever done any research, they excavated a site over there and found like 20,000 mass graves. <clears throat> so, it happened. Another way God judges is God sets up governments and God takes down governments. There's no doubt, in my mind, in the United States of America because of the Declaration of Independence, where in the first four paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, God clearly was part of the plan. The Founding Fathers, they may not all been living at the foot of the cross. They may not all been saved. I don't know. But I am telling you that they, revi they uh, relied on the providential care of God. They said there are certain truths that are self-evidence that come from the Creator. And there, in all four of those, I can't recite them right now, but if you'll look up William J. Federer and buy the book America's God and Country, you can see that. <clears throat> or probably if you just Google, uh, show me the Declaration of Independence, you, you'll see it the same way. So God sets up governments. He took down Israel. He took down Judah, right? Now, things begin to shift when we get into this New Testament and judgment attend. Uh, uh, tends to occur in eight areas. Now, this is the new plan that God had, and it starts out with, <clears throat> excuse me, the cross judgment. Okay, now if you want to reference this, this is in John 16, verse 11. Um, the cross judgment is that all the sins of the world <clears throat> are judged and nailed to that cross. Okay, so when Jesus was the Passover lamb, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said, when Jesus lays down his life and he's willing to die, right? <clears throat> this pays the sin debt for the whole world, okay? That's why when we get into all this studying and all these different things, um, 
you know, the first thing we've got to understand is I can go through life and I can pretend and I can play any game I want to play, but if I've never acknowledged that Jesus died for the sins of the world, there's no way I can get saved. And if you want a reference to that, I think it's John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So I can't get there. Okay. Unless the first judgment that God posed uh, or, or, or showed us in this New Testament was the judgment on the cross. And the judgment and the sin debt, right, was paid by the innocent, perfect blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So a lot of times in our lives, we have this tendency to believe my life is about me. I deserve what I get. I deserve what I go and do. I deserved my career. I deserved, you know, a wife and a mistress. I deserved whatever you think you deserve, right? But here's the deal. We don't deserve anything because God spoke this world into existence. God created us in his likeness and his image. God has made a way for us to get reconciled back to God because of where sin entered into the world in Genesis chapter 3. So if I don't look at that cross and acknowledge that Jesus is the only one that could forgive the sins of the world because he's the one that died for it. So he's got authority over the sin. That's pretty powerful if you stop and think about that for a second. So the power that Jesus has has to be acknowledged. Jesus Will you save me? Well, why would I save you? Jesus may say, well, Jesus, I'm a sinner. And when I got saved, I could rattle off some of the sins I do. I don't know how far getting saved goes if this is your prayer when you ask Jesus, Jesus, will you save me? I probably, I don't know if I sinned or not, but you know, whatever. I mean, I, I just need to be saved. I don't know if that would work, right? You say, well, you don't have any right to judge. I'm not judging. I just want you to think about this for a second. Shouldn't I know where I've sinned and fallen short of God's plan? Maybe my prayer needs to be, Lord, I was born a sinner. I was separated from you because sin entered into the world way before me in Genesis chapter 3. I read Romans chapter 2, or, or Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and, and, and 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and there's none good, no, not one. Lord, I can think of a handful of sins just as I think about the Ten Commandments of don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, <clears throat> don't commit adultery, don't uh, don't commit murder, don't bear false witness, don't have any other gods before me. So I've broken a lot of your commandments, right? And a lot of people say, well, that's the Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us. You better have God first. You better not be worshiping any graven images. You better not be taking God's name in vain. Now, we probably get a pass on honoring the Sabbath day as a Christian because, you know, we're not Jewish and the Jewish people, their Sabbath day was on the Saturday, see. And they were commanded to rest just like Jesus or God rested on the Sabbath day or the seventh day. So there's where that's at. So <clears throat> the first way that God's dealing with judgment of the six or eight ways, what I say, eight, eight areas, the first way was the cross judgment. Now, the second way of, is the believer's self-judgment that is talked about in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty-one. The self-judgment, here's my self-judgment in March of 1997. God, I know you're going to kill me if I don't stra straighten up. I'm selling beer for a living. I own two beer joints. I'm not doing things I need to be doing. I feel the conviction. I know you're going to kill me. And I know I can't go on. I know I can't get this. Because I had this stupid thought, just like a lot of people have. I'm going to get my life lined out, and then I'm coming, Lord. Silliness. Because that takes away from the power of God. The power of God is showed when we surrender. See? Take my burden. My burden is light, I think, is what, what the verse says on that. But it basically says, look, you surrender and let God show you his power. Because a lot of people say, well, I can't quit doing this. Well, I couldn't quit doing this. Well, if I could quit doing this, I'd get saved and go to church. Well, if you surrender and get saved, then God's going to handle it from there. And that's why the believer's self-judgment is important. And I heard an old Sunday school teacher, and he was old when I got saved uh, 25 years ago. But he said something that stuck with me, and what he said is, judge yourself so others won't have to. Now you say, well, you just said nobody's allowed to judge anybody. 
I'm talking about society judging you. If you go through life and you and you get out of here and you break the law of the land, you could go to jail. If you break the laws of God, you're going to go to hell. If you never come and acknowledge the things that Jesus did on the cross judgment, you're never going to see God anyway. So you're, you know, you're going to perish and end up in the place called hell anyway. That's why we have this Sunday school class at 6.55 in the morning, right? We want to get your attention. We want to get you when you're at your best because this, the thing is, if I have self-judgment, and my self-judgment is, well, I'm just as good as anybody. Well, my self-judgment is, well, I'm a prideful, arrogant person, and nobody's going to tell me what I got to do to be saved. I'm just as good as anybody else, and, you know, I'm, I'll just buy my way into heaven. You know, there's denominations. They're built on giving and buying your way out of sins and things like that. Pretty scary way to think about doing business, isn't it? Okay, so the first judgment is your cross judgment. I got to see that all that sin was nailed to that cross. Jesus died for the sins of the world because it had to have a sacrifice. He shed his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or forgiveness of sins. So Jesus paid all the sin debt from yesterday, today, and going forward. So all the sin debt is paid for. So what I have to do is I have to do a self-judgment of myself and see that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none good, no, not one. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Meaning, look, the judgment that's coming to the unsaved person is hell. That's all he can do because he's not interested in the things of God. God's done everything he can to get his attention. God put this book together. The devil would love to destroy it. The devil has watered it down with denominations, the devil's watered it down with different versions of this. And at the end of the day, man, we better seek to understand the things God wants us to understand in here. So, where am I at in this? Let me get to the third part of this. I've identified that I'm, I'm saved. Here's the third part of this judgment that continues to come to the Christian. It's the chastisement of the Father that's talked about in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 6. The chastisement of the Father is this. God loves you, and he's going to correct you. Well, how would God correct me? Well, there's a lot of different ways God will correct you. Have you ever been saved? Or I mean, you are saved, right? I'm saved, but I've done some pretty crazy things sometimes. And it's taken me a day or two sitting at the house by myself to get over the embarrassment of what I've done toward God. Now, a lot of times, people had no idea what I did, Right? Sometimes people probably did not. Man, Lunsford, way to show your high end, man, what an idiot, you know, because he's old, he's old Brooke Lunsford still in here with the, the Spirit of God, right? And I can be just as nutty, crazy, wild, stupid as anybody, right? But here's the deal. There is a judgment. There is a chastisement to come. Spare the rod, spoil the child. It's not about getting the paddle back in school but it's about doing some kind of discipline to let children know there's right and wrong. If I'm God's, I've got something going on as God's that I didn't have before, and that is a heightened conscience about what God wants me to do, what God allows me to do, right? If I do something and it's contrary to what God wants done, man, don't you think for about two or three days after it, man, I'm, I'm, I'm down and out. And about all I can do... It's not as bad as it, as it has been, but, you know, there's been years <clears throat> when it would take me two or three days sitting at the house saying, oh, man, whew, I cannot believe I did that. Cannot believe I said that. Can't believe, you know, whatever. So, you know, probably taking a big chance just speaking publicly here uh, on, on this show because, you know, I mean, I've been a raving lunatic. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I just am. And, and how I get around that is I study this Bible and I start my day with Jesus. Why? Because that lunatic is still in here. That crazy, loud, obnoxious, <laughs> you know, that nobody, I tell you, when I was under conviction, my own mom didn't want to see me coming. And there's no doubt that nobody has ever loved me like my mom, right? And grandma, uh, one of my grandmas, I know she loved me, but there wasn't no easy route with the grandma. She told me how hot hell was every time I saw her. You know, so there are some people that can get a, get by with tough love, right? And then my other grandmother, you know, she was, you know, she got saved a little later in life. So she's had a little more grace and mercy than Agnes. Now, Agnes Lunsford was like, 
y'all going to hell if you don't straighten up. And if you don't tell your dad to straighten up, he's going to hell. And, you know, just, I mean, so she didn't sugarcoat it, but she was raised a little harder. The times were tougher. You know, I think both her mom and dad had passed away by the time she was 15. So she relied on God, right? She depended on God to deliver her and take care of her brothers and sisters. But at the end of the day, you know, there wasn't a lot of sugar and spice in, in, in a lot of her delivery. So let's roll on here a little bit. We're going to run out of time. So uh, the chastisement comes because guess what? Okay. We need that. We need correction. Society needs correction. These kids in school need correction. And it kills my heart to know we're just turning them loose. We pretend like they didn't throw that spit ball. You know, we pretend that they didn't say that cuss word. We pretend because the paperwork and the aggravation and the fact that the principal is going to send them back to the office because they don't have time full with it, right? Um, yeah, there's there's still a few grandmas out there, but you know, Maureen, you're, what, where the problem is, is these grandmas went on to be with the Lord, and there's a couple of generations of people that haven't been in church, and that's why it is harder than it used to be. So you're exactly right. So here's what's going to happen. The chastisement comes from the Father because my conscience never bothered me before I was saved. I mean, I could do pretty much anything. I didn't think about the consequences. I didn't think about who I was hurting. I didn't care, you know, and I'm not proud of that, but I mean, there wasn't anything there. But when I got saved, all of a sudden, I used to cuss every breath, and I've told you all this. <clears throat> But when I got saved, man, it was it was over in a matter of months. Not only was it over for me cussing, but I couldn't even go around people that were cussing because I didn't want to hear it. That never bothered me before, you know. I grew up and going to beer joints and shooting matches and all these different things. You know, the flea market maybe not so bad, but I mean, I was always around older people, and older people, you know, have a tendency of having whatever habits grown ups have whether they're good or bad. And, you know, I'm observing this and I'm 8, 10, 12 years old, right? So I'm seeing it and I'm thinking it's pretty cool stuff, but it's not, you know? So now let me give you the fourth judgment. I'm going to speed this thing up a little bit and then we'll come back and cover it some other time if we need to. But there's a Bema seat judgment coming in and B-E-M-A is what the Bible calls it. And there was a place for the magistrates to come and that's what Paul was talking about. But I've always thought of that B-E for B-E believers, believers. Okay, the believer is going to come for a judgment in front of God, and he's not going to be judged for the sins. Okay, he's not going to be judged for the sins because Jesus was judged for the sins, right? But what I'm going to be judged as a Christian is what did I do as a Christian? Rex Hodge, what did you do as a Christian? Maureen, what did you do as a Christian? You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, number one, I've got to be a light to the world because Jesus was the light of the world. He said, I got to go prepare a place. But since I'm going to prepare a place, you be the light of the world, right? And that's why, <clears throat> that's why we're commanded to tell everybody about Jesus. If we go to Acts chapter one, verse eight, we're commanded to tell people in my community about Jesus, my family, my friends, and my enemies. Why is it important to tell an enemy about Jesus? Because you don't want that person dying thinking they're going to escape judgment because you, you you know, well, Brooke Lunsford cheated me. Okay, maybe he did. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying I'm against it, but you'd have to go back a few years for me to have cheated you on something now. But let's just suppose in your mind, Brooke Lunsford has cheated you. And you show up in at face-to-face -face with God and say, God... Um, Brooke Lunsford cheated me, and he's been talking about you on the radio for 25 years. I think I need to get into heaven because, you know, he's not a very good guy. And then Jesus says, look, it ain't about Brooke Lunsford. You know, it's about your relationship with me, and you don't have one. Pretty scary, isn't it? All right, so the Bema seed is that's coming. You're going to get a reward for what you did do. You're probably going to get like the seven letters to the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation. Hey, here's what you did do. This was great. Hey, here's what you should have done. It's better. And I had a preacher preach this message, and I hope this is wrong, but I'll share it because it's heartbreaking. But can you imagine if you and me have to escort family and friends, people we know, over to the open pit because we didn't go to them and tell them about Jesus? That'd be scary, wouldn't it? That'd be sad. 
you know, you'll be heartbroken over this situation. But you escort them over and say, you know, Jesus said, depart from me. Here, come with me. I'm going to show you the entrance to hell. That'd be heartbreaking, wouldn't it? All right. So the other judgment or the next judgment is the tribulation period. And we talked about this seven-year period of hell on earth when God pours out his wrath on those that are living at the time of the tribulation period. Why do I want to be saved today? I want to be saved today because I don't want to be here for tribulation period. Why should that invigorate us to go and tell people about being saved? Because we don't want them to be here during this period of time either. You see, we've got to get this thing moving in the right direction. We've got to realize that today is short. People are going to say, well, I've heard this all my life. Grandma Kennard would say, people tell me I've heard this. She's a little lady. I've heard this all my life. But I'm telling you right now, it's a lot closer today than it was yesterday. <laughs> and that was, she loved that, you know. She'd say, people better be a getting in. <laughs> and she said, we're going to go whoop, whoop, up to heaven. And, and that's going to be true. So we don't want anybody left for this tribulation period. Uh, the judgment of the Gentile nations you know, at the Battle of Armageddon, all these people that are alive at this point are going to line up at the direction of the devil, thinking that they can stop God from coming back. So once again, the deception is going to be strong. It says there's enough deception during tribulation period that even the very elect could be uh, sidetracked into believing some of these things of the devil. So it's coming, okay? So... Um, the judgment seat, the tribulation period, the judgment of the Gentile nations will happen when this battle of Armageddon is over, you know, and maybe, you know, that's somewhat part of it because people are going to die during this period of time. These people are going to come and they're going to get their judgment and, and that's the way it's going to be. So we'll give you two more here. Stay with me. I know we're running late. The next thing we've got is the great white throne judgment. Now, this great white throne is when everybody is raised up from the dead, from wherever they're at, and they're going to come, and there's going to be a book opened up, and it's going to be the book of life, and those people that are in the book of life, they miss the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is you coming as an unsaved person, and God looking you in the eye, and maybe you get a chance to say something to defend yourself, and I don't know if you, you're going to get that or not, right? But nonetheless, you're going to hear, depart from me, I never knew you. And so there will be the seventh judgment that God has planned for mankind. Now, what about the saved person? What about the creature that now has a glorified body? Now this person is in a position in God's service, will never be outside of God's service, will never be outside of God's control, in a place with no more sin, no more sorrow, and no more pain. Now the judgment comes to us to judge angels. And that verse for that is in, uh, let me see what it is. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. See, the fundamental principle of the divine judgment that's coming from Jesus Christ is he's going to judge us according to the truth. He's going to judge us according to the deeds that we have done. And he is going to shine the total light on us, Okay. And the gospel message is, have you accepted the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, what in the world is the good news? The good news is God, Jesus had a death, a burial, and a resurrection to show you that you could overcome death, hell, and the grave. And have you accepted that? If you have not, you will not, you will not make it through. Okay? And if you've appeared at the great white throne judgment, you don't make it through anyway. So it's pretty scary. Now, I really raced on those last couple, but I took a picture of this if you want to look at it, and I posted it just before we came on here because it's very important. Listen, I want us all to get along. I don't want to be fighting and arguing with you. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to, you know, I, you know, I'd never want to do anything to you. And if I have hurt your feelings, if I've said something you don't like, you know, you want to talk privately or call me on the telephone, I'll give you my number, whatever. But I'm telling you, you're not going to slick God on this. You're not going to slip into heaven on a technicality. Or you're not going to slip into heaven saying, well, if Brooke Lunsford saved, everybody saved. Because I know that guy. See, that's not going to work. And there's probably been a lot of people tried stuff like that. So let's get out of here. Let's go be productive. You have a wonderful day. 
And we appreciate you being here because, like I said, you keep me going. You keep me accountable. Sometimes as Christians, we need somebody to keep us accountable. So let's start the day out. Be safe out there, Norman Pennington, on that railroad. Rex, be safe. Everybody have a great day, and we'll try to be here with you tomorrow. If you've got something you want to look at, we've kind of beat on judgment all week. Uh, see what is this Wednesday. So Thursday, we can probably look for something else. If you guys have something, just send it over, and we'll do our best. Lord, we're thankful. Thankful for each of our friends here. And I look down through this list of that I can see, the three or four people, and I can think about how we, maybe Rex and I grew up together. I can think of Biff and I doing business together up in Cleveland. You know, I think about all the friends I have. I think about the years Norman Pennington and I have spent at the ball fields and, and just the reach that all of us have. We've got family. We've got friends that just don't want to know. They don't care. And, and we have to put ourselves in that situation because nobody could tell us anything either. But we've got to try to show them something. And if we can't show them words, Maybe we show them love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, and gentleness that comes from you, Lord. Because that's polar opposite to me, Lord. You know how loud and obnoxious I was as a human being. So for me to show love to an enemy, probably there's probably nothing I could do any greater than that to show somebody I loved them. I think that's probably why you told us to love our enemies. Because it wouldn't be easy. But number two, man, if we love our enemies... We've brought somebody that was totally against us back into the, the, to the service of the Lord, set them on this path to eternal life, and it would be a great blessing for all of us to see one more sinner get saved. And somebody will be last, and that church will be raptured out of here, and we'll get out of this tribulation judgment. And we don't want to be here for that. We don't want our worst enemy to be left behind for that. So, Lord, our prayer list is long, and we've got unspoken prayer list that each person that's listening this morning, listen to the prayer list that's on their heart. And on the top of our prayer list is our men and women in the military, our veterans that have already served us. Uh, man, these men and women are heroes. They have, have been willing to lay down their lives. They've been willing, in many cases, to give up their own health in order to do what they have done for us. So, Lord, bless them in a mighty way. We ask you also, Lord, to be with our policemen, firefighters, and our first responders. We have got to have law and order in society. And we looked at it in our second note here this morning about the chastisement from the Father. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. If you love people, you're going to correct them. You're going to tell them what's wrong. And I know some people may jump on here and say, you said not to judge. Listen, our kids have got to be They've got to understand the rules, the laws, and order. They've got to understand we've got to have law to have a society. <clears throat> and it's even ordained by God to have law and order. He gave it to Noah. When Noah got off the ark, he gave him human government. So, Lord, our policemen, firefighters, and first responders, we love these people. We respect what they're doing. Keep them safe. Protect them and protect them and protect them. And, and let's help society to understand that what these men and women are going out and facing every single day for us. And, and we need to help them and protect them and pray for them. Also, we ask for you, Lord, to be with our school kids. Man, school is such a, we need discipline. We've got to have it back, man. We cannot have school with, with, without discipline. Now, I know it's going to be a hard one. It's going to be, it's going to be a sad day. But it's got to be done or you're not going to have public school. It just is that simple, and I'm just heartbroken about it. But until, you know, until parents get tired of it, I guess that's what we're going to have. Our teachers are at wit's end because they can't. How do you teach when 7 out of 20 kids are up walking around the class and never shutting up the whole time? It just, it can't be done. So, Lord, I hope and pray that you find a way to get back in the schools. I wish that the schools would... Would, would listen. And the problem is, you know, it's all mandated from the federal government down to the state and the state down to the county and the county to the school. And nobody's on the front lines with these kids seeing what kind of lunatics that we have up there. And it's so sad because so many kids, you know, the top's always going to get by. They're the top. The bottom's always going to be the bottom. It's just going to be hard to do anything. But there's kids in the middle that have an opportunity and they're dependent on this free public school situation to get them to the next level. And we're failing these kids in a mighty way. <clears throat> Lord, also ask for you to be with our hospitals. 
man, our nurses and our hospital staffing are burned out. They're tired of it. And, you know, Lord, just in, in just talking about the hospitals, have you seen the amount of sporting events in the past week where people have fought either during the sporting event or walking down the tunnels because everybody's on edge? We need the peace that passes all understanding. <clears throat> Lord, you can give us that. You can give us that opportunity to get to you. You can give us the peace that's out there. And Lord, we're hoping and praying beyond all shadows of every doubt that you make it known that you are God and give everybody one more chance, two more chances, five more chances to get saved. Lord, you gave us way more than five chances. So let's get that last person saved and let's get out of here to this place called heaven. We know it's not your will that any would perish. So help us, Lord, to do a better job. Forgive us where we fail you, and we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We appreciate you guys. We love you guys. I'm telling you, you make me accountable. I mean, you think this face is, you think this automatically looks like this when I jump out of bed. It takes hours to get this face looking like this. <laughs> okay, that's a little white lie. But here's the deal. It don't matter who, who you hate. It don't matter who hates you. Try to make peace with them. I've got a couple of people I've tried to make peace. They don't want to hear it. That's not on me anymore. Okay. Jesus said, go into this town, tell them about Jesus. And if they will not receive you, go on out of town, shake off the dust from your feet and go on. You know, you're not here to be a punching bag for somebody else, but you really do need to take your time on this situation. Show people that you love them. Show people that you care. By your comments on here, you show that you care about me. I hope you see I care about you. Hopefully this stops somebody that's out there in the world that may not be going to church and they're like, you know what? What's what's this what's this thing all about? Hey, here's Ike McLeod on there. Well, I heard about Ike. He, you know, he witnessed everybody in the country. Well, if Ike's watching it, maybe I need to pay attention for a minute. Well, old Rex Hodge, well, do you remember that Johns Creek boy? Why, well, absolutely. You know, God saved Rex Hodge. Well, you know what? If God saved Brooke Lunsford and Rex Hodge, he'd probably save everybody. Maybe I can get in on that, and they sure can, can't they, Rex? All right, I got to quit. You guys, I love you. In Jesus, I appreciate you. Give us something. Let's get something new going, and we'll try to get on here in the morning and study it. See you later.